Okay, I'd like to compare and contrast passive with active transport. So passive transport is how molecules move from a high to low concentration, but active transport is really just the opposite. It's how molecules move from a low to a high concentration. You'll often hear in passive transport molecules move down their concentration gradient, and in active transport molecules move up or against their concentration gradient. Passive transport requires no cellular, cellular energy, no ATP, but during active transport cells must spend ATP, the energy of the cell, in order to perform active transport. So the reason for the river and the kayakers, the kayaker in black is symbolic of passive transport because the kayaker in black can just sit back, spend no energy, and let the current take the kayaker downstream. But the colored kayaker, because he's facing the opposite direction that the river is flowing, has to paddle very rigorously in order to move uphill. That's uh, or upstream. That's an example of moving up the concentration gradient. That was an example of active transport. Some examples of each diffusion osmosis, facilitated diffusion. These are examples of passive transport. And in active transport, the sodium potassium pump, contractile vacuoles, endocytosis, and exocytosis. We're going to talk about each as we go through this. So let's go ahead and start with passive transport, the movement of molecules from a high to a low concentration. As I said a moment ago, passive transport does not require the use of ATP energy. A great example of passive transport is diffusion. And a great example of diffusion is how molecules like oxygen can enter the bloodstream. You know, in our lungs, we have thousands and thousands of these air sacs called alveoli. And every time we inhale, the air sacs fill up with O2. They fill up with oxygen. And when that happens, I hope you can see there's a high concentration of oxygen in the alveoli, and there's a low concentration of oxygen in the bloodstream. So O2 is such a small molecule that it can actually pass through the layer of the alveoli and into the bloodstream when it's then picked up by a red blood cell. From high to low concentration, another oxygen molecule will slip through the alveoli and into the blood. And one more time, oxygen slips through, picked up by a red blood cell, and carried throughout the body. So this is diffusion, where molecules are really moving from a high to low concentration, and they're small enough where they can just pass through the outer layers. Another example of passive transport is something called osmosis, and this is really the same thing as diffusion, only it's the diffusion of water. So here's a cell that's been placed in distilled water. Distilled water is highly concentrated. It's pure H2O. There's no other impurities in it. And so if you were to place a cell in distilled water, I want to note the high concentration of water is on the outside of the cell, but inside the cell there's a lower concentration. So through osmosis, through passive transport, water molecules will diffuse into the cell and the cell will expand, possibly to the point where it could even burst. So this is a great example of osmosis, which is again an example of passive transport. And the last example of passive transport that I want to mention is something called facilitated diffusion. And this is a great example of how glucose is removed from our blood. First of all, the word facilitate means simply to help. Glucose is a fairly large molecule, and it needs help getting past the cell membrane into the cells. So there's these little protein channels, these little gateways that will allow molecules like glucose to come into the cell. So after we have a meal, the amount of glucose increases in our blood. And ultimately, this can be hazardous if too much glucose builds up and builds up and builds up. So what happens is that the pancreas will release insulin to cause these channels or these doorways here to open. 
And once that happens, you can see there's a high concentration of glucose in the blood. There's a low concentration of glucose in the cells. So from high to low concentration, the glucose simply diffuses into the cells. It's how your cells get the food that they need in order to do their cellular functions. But a great example of passive transport, no ATP energy was required, and the molecules move from a the glucose molecules move from a high to a low concentration. So let's go ahead and switch focus now to active transport. And as I said earlier, it's the movement of molecules from a low concentration to a high. It really is the opposite of passive transport. You know, you're often going to see active transport compared to pumps. And so here's two bicycle pumps, whether it's the foot pedal pump on the right or the handlebar pump on the left. In order to operate a pump, you have to uh, lift up and down on the handles or step up and down on the pedal, and you have to spend energy. Pumps require the use of energy. And in the, in the world of cells, energy comes from a molecule called adenosine triphosphate, ATP. So active transport requires the use of ATP energy in order to move molecules from a low to a high concentration. So a great example of a cellular pump would be the sodium-potassium pump. The sodium-potassium pump is really important in the role of how a neuron or a nerve cell sends an electrical signal to another. And it will pump sodium out of the neuron and will pump potassium into the neuron. I want you to pay attention to the brown sodiums at the bottom. Notice how there's a lower concentration of sodiums at the bottom, and there's a greater concentration of sodiums at the top. What happens is three sodiums at a time will load into the sodium potassium pump. And along comes a molecule of ATP. Now when ATP is broken, heat gets released. The heat causes the sodium potassium pump to change shapes and it allows the sodium to be removed from the neuron. Well, it's not just called the sodium pump, it's called the sodium potassium pump. Now I want you to focus your attention on the purple Ks, the purple potassiums. Notice how there's a lower concentration of potassium on top and there's a greater concentration of potassium on the bottom. Two potassiums at a time will load in the sodium potassium pump and it will change back to its original shape to draw the potassiums into the neuron. Great example of a pump that's designed to pump molecules from a low to high concentration with the use of ATP. Another great example is what's called the contractile vacuole that some cells have. Here you might recognize this is a cell called a paramecia. This is a, a freshwater creature uh, called a paramecium. It's in the kingdom protista microscopic. You need a microscope to see it. And right there I've just highlighted the contractile vacuole. And what this thing does is to prevent the cell from bursting, from taking on too much water, it will squeeze out extra amounts of water. It's a pump. It's a water pump. Let's look at this in a little more detail. So here's a, just a drawing of the paramecium in its watery environment. And all these black dots represent water molecules. Now right now you can see there's a high concentration of water outside the cell and there's a low concentration of water inside. So right now it's through simple osmosis. Water will diffuse into the paramecium. Now that's an example of passive transport. But watch what happens. The paramecium will respond by using its contracting vacuole, its contractile vacuole, and it will pump the extra amounts of water from a low concentration to a high concentration. It gets rid of the incoming water so it doesn't burst, and this is how cells like paramecium can survive in a watery environment. And then finally, I want to finish up with endocytosis and exocytosis, two examples of active transport where the cells will take molecules in or out with the use of ATP. You know, here's a bacteria cell, and here comes a white blood cell. And this is going to be a great example of endocytosis. 
so the white blood cell will slowly devour and wrap its cytoplasm around the bacteria until the bacteria has been taken into the cell that's what endocytosis means endo means within cyto means the cell so the bacteria has been taken into the cell now it, it, the the white blood cell needs to spend some atp energy in order to do this and once the bacteria is trapped E for enzymes are placed inside of uh, that little protective pouch that the vac uh, that the uh, the bacteria has been placed within, and eventually the bacteria will be killed. It's one way that the white blood cells protect us from infection. So to finish up this video on active transport. I want to mention the process called exocytosis, which is really to get rid of or to release materials from the cell. So here comes a cell part known as a vesicle. The vesicle perhaps is carrying those uh, black dots. Maybe those black dots are proteins that the cell is going to get rid of. And what happens is the vesicle will actually fuse with the cell membrane or the plasma membrane because the vesicle and the plasma membrane are made from the same molecules, a phospholipid bilayer. And ultimately, those black dots, those proteins, will then be released outside the cell. And again, this process requires the use of ATP in order for this to happen. Great example, again, of active transport. Okay, so I just wanted to return to this slide right here where you could compare and contrast passive versus active transport. You know, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Place them in the comment box below. Let me know how, how useful this video was. Uh, good luck in your understanding of biology.